you're alive all around. Hello, everyone. We will leave. Uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes, maybe one minute, for our Zoom attendees to join, and then we'll start our in conversation event. Welcome in, everyone. So we're here at uh, 625 Falk in the Fashion Building, uh, and we have students joining us on site for the talk and the presentation and the event with lead event today. And we're waiting just one more minute for our Zoom attendees to join. Right. Welcome to the In Conversation series and the talk with Lydia Vant, the founder of California Cloth Foundry. Uh, Lydia is joining us today from uh, Los Angeles, from her studio. And um, over to you, Lydia, to share with us your journey as a founder of California Cloth Foundry Factory. I also have here with me Jennifer John from the textile design department and the students joining us on campus at the School of Fashion Building, who will chime in with their questions as we open up the floor for conversation with Lydia. Lydia, over to you. Thank you for joining us today. Hello. Hi, Alina. Hi, Jennifer. So good to Hello, see you. Yeah, it's been good to see you. It's been a long time, but I'm really great to see you it's actually here. Um, and thank you, um, Alina, for inviting me on this uh, on this fireside or conversation fireside chat conversation with uh, the students there at the textile department. Um, yes, I'm in downtown LA, and um, I wanted to I you know since I'm going to be here, kind of introducing myself and then doing a little bit of show and tell of my products that I create um, that are behind me on the wall. I wanted to ask that you guys um, go to my website while I just give a kind of brief introduction on myself. Um, so while you're doing that, that's my home page of my company. Um, so the short, the short version is I've been in the industry for over 25 years. Um, and I think there was a, um, a bio on the announcement about some of the companies that I worked with, but I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a longer version of my textile and apparel career and why natural fashion is my path. The short an answer to why natural fashion is my path is because our clothes are making us sick and textiles are toxic. Because I spent the first half of my career contributing to the problem I've dedicated the second half to being part of the solution. Part of the solution includes one of the projects that I'm doing right now and why I'm in Los Angeles at my studio reading from this piece of paper instead of in conversation with you guys at the Academy of Art today. Um, my company is in the middle of developing our second program for Gaia Herbs. It's a 35-year-old supplement company that approached us about creating natural fashion colored in their medicinals. The first was a black elderberry hoodie that their wellness ambassador, Giselle Bunchen, gifted to her community alongside Gaia Herbs black elderberry syrup and her cookbook. I'm here working on the second collaboration. I'd love to speak about that after I introduce how I got to this talk today. So right there, Scott, if you, there's me, Actually, on the home page, if you scroll down, I'm working on those Gaia Herbs hoodies. And if you scroll, if you click to my Instagram, you'll see Giselle in the hoodie that I'll, I'll show you. There she is. So that hoodie was dyed, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, but that was dyed with Gaia Herbs elderberry, organic elderberry extract and printed with Gaia Herbs organic elderberry extract. Um, and that was our first collaboration. The second I'll go into a little bit in the Q&A probably. So my company, um, oh, all right. So 
A little bit about my background. Before moving to San Francisco and having two babies, I worked in New York City on 7th Avenue for a number of large brands such as Bloomingdale's, Calvin Klein, Jones New York, The Limited Stores, Terry Ellis America under the design direction of Tom Ford, and a number of other smaller um, chain stores. I worked with design teams on large-scale apparel development in a very competitive market. I was praised and rewarded for negotiating pennies out of every step of the supply chain for the benefit of our clients' profit margins. And what I didn't know and soon became aware of is that our collective actions were creating the race to the bottom of not only, a quality, of not only quality and ethics, but materials integrity, leading to an ever-growing rise in toxicity. With this knowledge, there was no turning back. In 2002, at my mom's group of two-year-old toddlers, I shared my sustainable goals with a fashion greenie, Linda Gross, asking if I should attend her school, California Cloth Foundry, I mean, sorry, <laughs> sorry, CCA. Um, Scott, if you'll just scroll up to the top and just leave it there, yeah, that'd be great. Or I can actually go on to my studio. But Linda Gross is a teacher at, a, at California College of the Arts. She's also a dear friend of mine, and we both had two-year-old toddlers at the time. I asked her if um, I should attend her school, CCA, to hone my understanding of textiles and even uh, deepen them from my previous job and experience. And Linda told me that Academy of Art University had a better textiles department, so I decided to complete my incomplete bachelor's degree because I dropped out of FIT to work full-time in New York City. And I finished it there under the guidance and mentorship of Rona McKenzie in the textile department at the Academy. This is when my life changed. At age 40, from a simple mission of being a good mom, providing a healthy life for my daughters, and working towards a sustainable textiles degree and job, to, go, to going full green with a purpose to scale natural fashion. I was diagnosed with breast cancer while breastfeeding my second child, and I was convinced that environmental toxins and my clothes had something to do with it. There was no looking back or compromising. My early career, coupled with my cancer, taught me this. Our skin is our largest organ and can absorb up to 64% of the chemicals you put on it. All conventional dyes, printing pigments, and fabrics treatments are petrochemicals, and all plastic clothing is not only toxic, but most likely an endocrine disruptor as well. Adding this knowledge to my loss of my breasts and my fertility from cancer and the perfect storm of my pur purpose was formed to reverse engineer the supply chain green and clean and what better way to do it but with natural textiles and apparel. Our mission and purpose here at California Cloth Foundry is to make a healthy wardrobe in collaboration with nature because we believe that what you put on your body is as important as what you put in your body. My ultimate goal is to wrap everyone in nature and scale natural fashion, not only to heal the industry beautifully, but to help scale change through natural innovations in green chemistry. So let's open it up to questions. Um, maybe Alina, you have um, some questions for me and then I can show you a little bit of what's going on behind me at the studio. Yeah, absolutely, of course. And we will have also questions from our Zoom guests who are currently introducing themselves in the chat. And I will share their questions as they, as they come in. So um, right. yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story. It is moving and inspiring. And um, when you started your brand, what was the very first thing you thought you should do? Like, what was the starting point now that you shared your values? in a more kind of entrepreneurial uh, way, what did you do first when you um, entered this entrepreneurship journey? Thank you. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, Alina, the, the beginning of my company, I, um, I was always form, forming those goals once, once I was completing my um, degree there at Academy uh, in Textiles. And I was also spending the weekends going to textiles workshops. One was at the Fiber Shed and it was a mushroom dyeing workshop. And I met Rebecca Burgess, the founder of the Fiber Shed and asked her what she was up to. And we became friends and she said that she was doing a project with the North Face. 
and she invited me as a commercial um, supply chain expert to manage the supply chain um, with the North Face and represent the fiber shed in doing this first farm to fashion or uh, as they call it, soil to soil, soil to skin to soil project. So the first project that I actually did um, was um, supposed to be 200 hoodies and I'll show it to you here. And it ended up being 7,000 hoodies. So I scaled it pretty quickly. And because of the scale um, and because it was a nonprofit I was working with, I founded California Cloth Foundry as a S Corp and then a California beneficial corporation to manage the supply chain for this North Face backyard hoodie. A little bit wrinkled, but you can go on my website and read a little bit more about it on um, the Fiber Shed website. And this website, or this website, this hoodie, when I was making it, people were asking me, what are you up to? What are you doing? And I said, because uh, you're so busy all the time. You're going down to Los Angeles. You're going over to the Carolinas, to the mills. What are you doing? And I said, I'm making a hoodie that's good enough to eat. And they're, they're laughing at me. But I said, cotton's a carbohydrate. This is organic cotton. It's color-grown cotton and um, cleaner cotton from the Central Valley of California. So it's all grown here in California. It's, it's oxidized color with, um, with ferrous sulfate coming from your multivitamin. That's iron coming from your multivitamin. Um, there is nothing on this fiber that is, um, that is unhealthy or toxic. So essentially this carbohydrate is good enough to eat. So you can wear it and then you can plant it afterwards if you want to um, with no toxins. Um, uh, any, any worry about toxins that would um, be either on your skin or in the soil after you compost it. So that was, this is the first project I did. Yes. When was it? What's, what's the timeline? Like when, when did you do that project? 2013, 2014. And I founded, uh, I, I incorporated um, California Cloth Foundry in 2014 because it was, a, it was a large minimum, large supply chain that I had developed. Um, and, you know, to, to manage the entire supply chain, um, we also needed to meet minimums, not only in the fiber purchase um, and the yarn purchase, converting the fiber into yarn, but also converting the yarn into textiles. And obviously the North Face converted the textiles into apparel. So they cut and sewed it, but I got to work with them very, very closely. So that was into 2013 or 14. Mm -hmm. How did the name uh, come about, the name of your company? Oh, California Cloth Foundry? Um, we were, you know, I, I was actually, I was in partnership with um, another of the fiber sheds kind of innovators. We were working on a wool mill feasibility study for the fiber shed. And so it was this, this other woman, Amber Beeg and I coming up with something that would be catchy. It would represent California. It would represent what we're doing, cloth. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of foundry is just like, this is where it's being made. This is the innovation. And um, so it just, it rung, it sounded good. And um, this is this is where it's all happening. It's all local. We and do everything has, in Los It has indeed a very kind of a maker, maker vibe with the, with the foundry. As um, a, yes, exactly. There's, yeah, we're making it. We're farm to the fashion. So it's not, it, we're not purchasing finished goods to convert into clothing. We were the foundry of the, of the, you know, of the fabric as well. Yeah. Tell us about your work with the, with the mills. Um, as you travel and you meet with the mills, do you educate them on the process or do you help them innovate and develop the fabrics that would meet your standards what is kind of a in a in a um, uh, more on the ground as you meet with the mills what's your process of working with them so it's always and i think i mentioned that briefly in my quick little reading off a piece of paper here about myself it's always about reverse engineering we always have a goal in mind and then we go back down the supply chain to create what's going to work from the fiber, whether we're purchasing, where we're purchasing the fiber, or if we're told where to purchase the fiber, um, 
we need to know what the volume is going to be, so we purchase the fiber first, and most of it's from either California, New Mexico, uh, Nevada. We've got um, climate beneficial wool from California, Nevada. We've got organic cotton from Texas and New Mexico and Arizona. Um, we then find the right yarn spinners. Normally we don't do anything to the, to the fiber. It's just mechanically converted into yarn. So there's no toxins added to that fiber in the, in the process from the farm to the yarn. And all of the yarns that we work with, because we work on finer fiber or finer fabric that are, you know, they're, they're all circular knit. They're all done in mills. They're not hand knit big yarn. So those yarns are all spun on the East Coast. There's nothing that can, there's no mills on the West Coast or West of the Mississippi that can actually spin a yarn fine enough to go into textiles that we create. Um, so we go to the Carolinas and we work with yarn spinners that are specific to our end goal. Mostly the French cherries, the jersey, the t-shirt jerseys, the ribs. We have a double-faced wool cotton. Um, the wool is spun in Maine. The cotton is spun in the Carolinas. Sometimes the yarn will then be treated, pre-treated with like ferrous sulfate or a little hydrogen peroxide in Georgia. And then it is trucked over to California now where we do our circular knitting in the mills here. Um, so they're all in like Linwood, Compton, Commerce, um, all over Los Angeles area. And then we have finishing and um, dye houses that are all the chemistry, the green chemistry that I mentioned at the end. Mm -hmm. um, those are all here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We have one question from um, one of our Zoom guests, Valeria Klitschko. Uh, who is an art director alone, is asking, what is your advertising strategy? How do you represent your brand? Uh, how do you represent, excuse me, your brand identity via uh, digital platforms? That's a great question. We're still working on that. Um, I guess come join us and, and you know, we can chat about that. Uh, so before COVID, we were ramping up and we, we, updated our website and we launched our in-house um, brand, which is what um, was being scrolled and shown when I was kind of reading about my personal story. Um, and all of that is done um, in-house. We had, we had five, five people working here. We had, you know, two of us full-time, three of us full-time, and we had two that were, you know, part-time as far as doing social media work and, you know, assistant design work. And then during COVID, we just kind of whittled down to um, contract workers. So at this point, what we're doing is just social media. It's only Instagram. Barely, we ever, we ever barely touch Facebook. You know, it's, uh, we do need to um, ramp up a little bit, but we've never done any advertising. We've never paid for advertising. Everything we've done is in trade with micro influencers and the other part of that is that the brands that we work with um, and the nonprofits that we get to work with, um, we, we, in kind, we actually get a lot of their, um, you know, their followers, their, their customers. So it's, it's really kind of guerrilla marketing, I would say. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us more about the collaborations with brands? You mentioned them in the, in the introduction. Um, maybe a few more words about your current collaborations or what's coming up, what's baking. Yeah, so thank you. Um, the, the other large recognized brand that I would say, and, and I do believe it's really all about food, because as I said before, what you put on your body is as important as what you put on your body, um, or what you put on your body is as important as what you put in your body. The, the um, farm, to, farm to table um, guru founder Alice Waters um, was um, doing a fundraising gala dinner at the Global Climate Action Summit in 2018 and asked us to make 92 farm to tablecloths for her in her Alice Waters green, which was like, okay, so we're making farm to tablecloths. 
they have to be fireproof because this is a huge gathering at Fort Mason and Bloomberg was there, ex-governor Jerry Brown was there. Um, you know, there's a lot of amazing movers and shakers. And so we, um, we not only matched her green, which if you can go, you can see on my Instagram, you can see Alice Waters, maybe, I think she's on there somewhere, but she's in this color dress. So they gave us a Pantone chip uh, color and they said, can you match this as closely as possible? And it's going to be banquet sized tables. So they're like nine feet by four feet wide. And so we had to find the right fabric, which was Texas organic canvas. And then we had to dye it in, in natural dyes, obviously, dyes that are good enough to eat. So we chose indigo because it's a beautiful blue, which is here. Mm -hmm. This is Northern California indigo. And we chose weld, which creates this, weld is weld weed. It's a, it's a beautiful like shrub that's grown all over the world um, very easily. It's very climate beneficial to, to kind of beneficial insects in, in agriculture. And that was a yellow. And so we made this beautiful green and then we fireproofed it with inorganic salts that are um, completely, you know, clean and, and easy to, cons to, you know, consume back into the environment. Um, there you go. I don't know if you can find it. Yeah, keep on scrolling down. And then, um, and we delivered 92 farm to table claws for their big um, gala. And um, that was that program. And then it's down quite a ways. And then another program that we've done, I would say we've, we've I can't, that, there's, oh, so these little bags that I just showed you, these were the cutting room waste the, that your cursor is on right now. So these were the cutting room waste to our tablecloths. And so we had these long strips of cutting room waste. So we cut them and sewed them into all of our waste into, cause we try to be as zero waste as possible into little kind of pencil bags. And we gifted them to everybody in our supply chain because they hustled so hard. They worked, um, uh, they're not used to natural dyes. They're not used to natural chemistry. We restricted their, you know, their, mostly their chemistry. Um, down to what we, you know, we required to create this beautiful farm to tablecloth. So this was a little bonus bag gift that I was showing you before. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Let's, let's keep your Instagram up so we can um, enjoy sharing your work all while discussing it. We have one of our Zoom guests, Maria, who is a textile major as well. Um, sharing in the chat. Recently, I saw an interview with Giselle. She's living in Costa Rica currently. Will you be collaborating with Giselle and with the Costa Rican community again? Giselle has a farm in Costa Rica. Will Giselle grow natural dyes in her farm for your company? Having a collaboration with Giselle is very cool. So that's... Yes. <laughs> <Good comments. Yes. laughs> I, I'm, I'm very thrilled to I bet that Giselle actually wore one of the the hoodies that that we gifted her um, so she this was actually a project for Gaia herbs so she is not representing our company she's she is the wellness ambassador for Gaia herbs and what they were doing and they I, I actually um, you'll you'll have to you'll have to ask Gaia herbs but what they were doing with Giselle was actually, I think, advising her farmers. We work with the farmers at Gaia Herbs, and I think they're advising what, um, you know, as far as regenerative um, agriculture, what they would plant. And I, I don't really think it's going to be dyed plants just yet, but that's something that maybe I could recommend to Kate, the, uh, the manager of, of the regenerative farm at Gaia Herbs, and see what she has to say about that. Mm -hmm. So... Well, um, the Giselle hoodie was, um, that was a, that was actually a marketing program for Gaia Herbs um, so that they could launch um, Giselle's cookbook and, and really promote one of Giselle's favorite um, uh, medicinals there at Gaia Herbs. So she's, she's their ambassador. I don't work with her. I wish I did, but I'm so pleased that she's actually wearing our clothing. 
Um, so yeah, as far as more work with her, I'm doing more work with Gaia Herbs and the next program is going to come out in the end of September, beginning of October as gifting for um, not only, I guess, their, their special projects, but possibly, um, you know, as, as an as a ongoing program. And I can't really talk much about that yet because it's still in the works, but it is going to be the Pantone color of the year 2024, which is this beautiful kind of okay. California poppy meat, peach soft color. And we're going to be using their herbs once again to, to incorporate into this, uh, to the color and to the garments. How, how do you work with, oh, we have a question from our um, on-site attendee. Let me turn the camera over. Go on and share your question. Um, I wanted to ask, first, I'm fascinated because I drink Gaia herbs. <laughs> Me too. Um, but I wanted to ask you, what other holistic practices do you think are important to implement either like in the studio or, or like the development process apart from manufacturing i didn't hear is that what uh, can you repeat the the beginning the practice yeah. what practice we can come okay we can come over so the question on ethical practices we go on and, and share it over yeah get yourself oh, yeah okay close up yeah uh, okay hi um so my question is, what other holistic practices uh, do you consider are important to implement in the development process, maybe in the studio or like with your employees, apart from the manufacturing of like the spinners and dyes and all that? I, I didn't hear the first word, but I think it's ethics. Is that what you're saying? The, no. the ethical uh, practice? Oh, no. Claudia, come this way. It's <laughs> holistic, it's holistic, holistic practices. No, the mic, this oh, is the okay, mic. Okay. Uh, it's about holistic practices that you incorporate in your work or as part of the research. Yeah, yeah well, uh, um, sorry, I'm looking over here, but because you're over there. Uh, the holistic practices, I think you can go back on to um, Elena. You can go back on to the studio. So the holistic practices that, um, I don't know where I am here, but can you, you're viewing online edu what, what screen are we on? We are on your Sorry. Instagram. Okay. Well, I think you can go off the Instagram right now, um, unless you want to look at the, oh, you didn't, it's fine. The holistic practices are soil to soil, right? So as far as Alina, Yes. Do you want to go off of the um, website? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> it's just nice to speak directly face to face when I'm answering questions. And the question was, what holistic approaches do I incorporate into the soil to soil natural fashion that I produce? So holistic wise, it, it all comes from soil. It's all going back to soil. We have composted our cutting room waste right here, as I can show you, with the city of Los Angeles. So the city of Los Angeles ran a pilot with California Producer Stewardship Council, and that is an NGO. It's a, it's a political activist group that is working on um, policy in textiles specifically, and I was in their, I was in their, um, pilot program with the city of Los Angeles, um, textile waste management. So not only do, are we trying to be zero waste and we utilize all of our scraps of our, of our garments. And in fact, I collect, you can see those bags down there. I collect all the cutting room waste. We collect all the cutting room waste from all of our production, whether it's for Alice Waters, which, you know, we made those little gifts or it's for Giselle's, uh, you know, hoodie program. It's not hers, it's for Gaia Herbs. But anyway, every, every time we cut and sew garments, we collect those, um, that waste, and we are either going to um, turn it back into yarn in a mechanical process, and we only use our cutting room waste because we're ensured that it's non-toxic, or we compost it, and that compost was with the city of Los Angeles that we, created soil in eight weeks with the composting of our natural fashion. 
So the holistic is, um, it's really about the environment. And not only are we, you know, healing, I would, I would say the industry by showing that everything can be naturally made and with green chemistry, but also that that waste is not going to sit and create toxic sludge and, and environmental degradation somewhere offshore where we're not really aware of our impact. So it's, it's definitely um, impact all the way through the supply chain to the end of life. Um, a little bit about labor. Um, our labor practices are, um, are um, all, they're, they're all in America, right? So our entire supply chain is mostly California. If we go over to the uh, Carolinas or Georgia or you know, the East Coast, um, we, we go in first person and work with the, with the mills. We work with the, um, the mechanics at the mills. We work with the dyers and the chemists at the dye houses. We work with the sewing rooms here. I work directly. I go into every um, marker and pattern making meeting to make sure that what is being made um, is, is as clear and as precise as possible. And I always collaborate with all of those experts. Um, this last one, when I did the Gaia hoodies, we only did 110 hoodies. And, um, and when I went in to work with the cutting room and the sewing room, um, it was, and it still is, it was abundant citrus um, fruit season here. So I would pick um, oranges from my friend's backyard and go into the sewing room and hand every single sewer an orange and look them in the eyes and check, you know, check in with them. Say, how's it going? You know, you know, kind of a joke, but it's like, oh, there's the crazy designer coming in with the bag of oranges to, <laughs> to give us an orange and just say hello. But it makes a difference and I would never work. Um, none of our supply chain would work with a factory or a manufacturer that didn't have um, ethical, you know, labor practices, fair living wages, not just fair trade um, wages and um, an environment that felt unsafe or unhealthy for those um, employees. So that's, Beautiful. I think I've come. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, um, um, mesmerized and beyond impressed with the very close tie of your work with the science and innovation. How do you do this? Do you have, um, do you educate yourself and your team constantly on those practices? Or do you have uh, a scientist, a PhD, uh, or uh, you know, spe specialist in the team? Like, what's your process of keeping up? with science and research in your field uh, all while educating your partners. So what's the, what's your kind of life learning experience like or your routine and keeping up with innovation in your field or the latest research and development or maybe if you do have like a, a dedicated science partner or a lab that you kind of can conjointly run the, the research programs together. Like tell us more about collaboration of, of your company with this with science and scientists as a as a field and kind of a more in a more practical way. How do you how do you approach this? Thank you. Yeah, and you just said it. Keyword is collaboration. That's it. Um because it's always project based, you know, when I mean I've been making textiles even when I was a designer in New York. So I, I know how to make textiles. And that was really, you know, the, the ingredients, the materials. Once I realized that like the yarns and fibers were toxic, I was like, oh my God. So then I moved into the chemistry of it, the printing, the dyeing, Academy of Art. And um, it's always been about um, learning on the job, right? And so when we get a project, um, we, we go out and we find the best because that's, that's, that's how you, you know, entice those, those vendors to trust you and to actually change what they're doing. Um, so as far as chemists, oh, I, I just want to add one more thing before I go into like the experts that I work with is that 
when we go in and work with vendors, we don't ask them to take risks and liabilities in investing in these very expensive new fibers and 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 chemistry that's that's I mean natural chemistry and natural dyes and and mordants um, are very expensive and we get all our food grade we get all our mordants which is kind of the magnet chemistry that holds the natural dye on the we get that from the food industry here in Los Angeles mostly and in France so um, before we do that, we work with chemists that um, have been in the industry for a while. So I worked with a chemist who was the chair of the American Association of Textiles, Chemists and Colorists of California. He was our chemist for um, the, this collection that I composted with the city of Los Angeles. He was our chemist for the um, farm to tablecloths for uh, Alice Waters. Um, and he, Bill Morris, and he, he's now working at a, a mushroom uh, leather company and a uh, dear friend, he's just amazing. Um, so he's, he's a chemist, you work with chemists, and he then formulates um, according to our needs, you know, our, our protocol, what he, he formulates the, the protocol that's going to work the best with the dye houses and the printers. Um, we also have worked with the French Permaculture Institute. We worked with the director, um, Anna, um, and she actually works with, uh, I had said when we were doing our charcoal, which is right here, this charcoal ray right here is from chestnuts and iron. And the, the coral that we did here is from matter root. And I said, um, and what's going to happen if we, we hit a home run and we, we get an order of five to 20,000 uh, distributed over, you know, a year, how are you going to replenish that chemistry um, from France? And she said, oh, that's not a problem because my two big customers, Chanel and L'Oreal, um, that matter root is in the red hair dye and lipstick and the charcoal, uh, the, yeah, the charcoal color, which is actually chestnuts and iron. That chestnut is in natural dyes for, uh, for L'Oreal's hair dyes, hair color. So they're in abundance. They're con continually producing that high grade organic um, uh, natural dye. So that's kind of, we work with that caliber so that when you go into a dye house that's used to plastic and, uh, you know, fibers and, and petrochemicals and solvents made from natural gas, you can say to them, we've already purchased the best product for you to use. And here's our chemist who has formulated it for you. And the other part of that is they've got, according to their timing of how a uh, roll of fabric is dyed, it, it, it can't be two days to, to dye something. It has to be within their uh, pre-established um, pre timing and formulation. And so what we did was we learned how they dyed a roll of fabric with conventional dyes or they printed a roll of fabric in conventional pigments. And then we reverse engineered all of our formulas and our ingredients into it. That's it's a little geeky. That's, that's fascinating. Kind of design. <laughs> fascinating. I sincerely hope you'll write a book. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> or, or if you want to collaborate with the writer, I, I'm so convinced that this is very necessary for everyone being part of the process to get educated. And that leads to my next question. Um, you're, so you work project-based collaborating with brands. So do you have in place your own distribution circle, so say, uh, distributing and uh, commercializing your, your own line, or you practically always work on a project with a brand as a uh, sustainable textile manufacturer where it's their product and their design with your textile input, like how on the economical side of things, how you kind of uh, orchestrate yeah. this. Yeah, so it's it's hard because um, at this moment we're really tiny. It's a tiny team. We're you know we're working with a lot of um, different contractors, and 
what happens is we we launch our line and then we do a project which kind of slows our our distribution and our inventory development and replenishment that slows everything down on the California Cloth Foundry brand of clothing, which is this is one of the hoodies I'm wearing. I wear it every day. Anyway, um, the the so it's a, it's it's sticky. You go back and forth, right? So you definitely want to work with these amazing brands because it it's moving the needle for you know more broader scale um, education. You know, that's super important um, and it educates the consumer. And then, you know, in turn, we then want to bring back um, that consumer possibly to our brand or other brands that are doing natural fashion as well. And I just want to grow together, you know. And so how we we maintain that um, distribution and scale um, to grow ever so slowly or faster if we possibly can is to, you know, is to juggle, you know, we go back and forth. Like at this moment, um, we're only selling online because our inventory of our collection is quite low. We've got a, uh, our next collection, which is our um, farm box that we're going to be launching. We were supposed to have launched it already. It's on our homepage, you know, it's our cotton wool collaborative cloth climate beneficial collection. Um, the pants I was wearing when I got up and grabbed something over there, you know, we've got, we've got some beautiful wovens and twill. We've got some gorgeous new styles and yet always our, our programs for our collaborative, you know, our collaborations like Gaia, they, they, they kind of set us back in the, in the, um, in our own, in our own sales and distribution. So right now it's direct to consumer online. Um, we have sold at retail stores. We had, um, a store in San Diego, a, a couple of them in Los Angeles, um, a store in San Francisco, but because the inventory was so low, a store up in, um, um, sorry, I'm gonna, um, it's not Guerneville, but up near Guerneville. And what happens is if we, if we distribute, too much of our inventory out to retail stores at a wholesale price, that means that when people come to our website, we don't have it for them at full price for them to purchase from us. So we're, 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 we're trying to play that balance right now. Yeah. And we have to go back into the, uh, the sewing room and, and cut and sew some more uh, inventory to get uh, replenish online. What do you think would help now that you outlined the challenges? What uh, what is your message to the kind of e economical universe? Let's say, um, would it be uh, a benefactor, an investor who would invest to the brand to help amplify your values? Uh, or um, how, how would you see this? How do you wish you know, kind of bigger economic powers would support the brands like yours? What What is your message for them? What do you wish them to do? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, anybody out there that's got a couple million bucks, come join me. <laughs> if you're aligned, not even if, but hopefully you're aligned um, with with the same values and purpose and want to make a difference. You know, we, we need to amplify and marketing you know, is huge and, and we need marketing help. Um, investment, definitely. Um, team members, always. You know, to scale this as fast as possible is what I would like to do. Um, and not afraid of partnerships and spreading the wealth. It's really about, um, it's really about alignment, like um, investors that are, are, are really out there to make a difference with us. You know, and they'll have their own ideas, which is what we want to do is collaborate in different ways that we haven't thought of yet. Do you think, do you feel you have a, like a unity or like an alliance or a union of like-minded brands that help each other to um, kind of have that unified message and hopefully hope to just revolutionize the, the field altogether and convert existing mills to sustainable practices 
do you feel you you have that helpful shoulder of your of your network but even in a kind of a more formal way are you do you feel there is kind of a structure in place or a need for that oh absolutely so as you mentioned, I and mean, you mentioned a lot there, Alina, it's, it's tough. So you, you said a few things. So you said scale in community, and then you said scale in mills, converting mills from conventional, which is a petro, you know, crude oil and natural gas based um, ingredients with petrochemicals and solvents that are, you know, endocrine disruptors causing infertility in our you know, in, in our future, and now, actually, fertility has dropped. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody wants to check that out, um, and they're associating, fertility has dropped almost 50%, I think, in the last 30 years or less. And um, they're directly relating that to the use of plastics. And as I said before, plastic um, fibers are polyesters and nylons, and there's a number of other ones. Um, we call them plastic dyes and printing pigments, but it's just petrochemical derived. Um, there's BPA and phthalates and PFAS that we're trying to ban from the industry. So if we could, those are all used in conventional mills. So if we could convert, fully convert, which is what you had said kind of in the middle of your question, if we could fully convert um, probably a, a spinning mill, Mm -hmm. um, and, and a woven's mill and a dye house to natural. That would be that would be the way to show by example how it can be done globally, and then hopefully set policy. And everybody says no policy. We need to you know they keep pushing out the goals to 2030, 35. And I'm mm -hmm. like no, it can be. We've already done it. It can be done now, but that takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of partnership, and we do have these groups that we gather once every couple months in Los Angeles and sometimes in San Francisco. Um, one is a bunch of fashion designers um, and, and one of the facilitators, he's from the Textile Exchange, it's a nonprofit, um, which is great, go check out Textile Exchange. Um, but this group, I should say, and this group, this group is small. And we're all struggling to support our, our own brands. And we're all trying through conversation to rise up together. So that's one part of it. The other part is, you know, mills in America, which is where I'm working right now, because you can be their first person and actually enact this change without any worry that the that the chemistry and the, the fibers are going to be swapped out or the yarns are going to be swapped out for something cheaper which is what I talked about from my back history. If you go offshore and you are, you're, you're pinching pennies out of that supply chain, you say, ah, oh, it's too expensive. Can you, you know, can you reduce it 10, 20, 40%? They're definitely going to go to a more toxic, more petro, petrochemical based alternative, which is already there in abundance. So if you do it here in America with a lot of money to actually make sure that that mill has their labor force supported ethically and and financially um that's i think the the first way to start or in europe you know partnering with a european mill or a european team so we're we're dabbling in that in community uh communications um but it's not happening fast enough so do you think european males are more receptive to Pivoting in the right direction, where do you feel kind of more traction with the mills owners? In the well, mill owners, they're um, fearful, you know, it's, they're afraid that they're going to put all this money and investment into new um, machinery and chemistry and materials, and then it will be just a test, right? And you don't have that guarantee that the next five to 10 years of that investment that they've just done will pay off in, in spades. And that's what it needs to be. We need to know that, that there's a system that we're setting up now that's going to be supported um, to grow um, natural innovation wise. Um, and I think policy is one of the ways that can support that 
uh, growth, right? Because what mill is going to invest, you know, half a million, five, 10 million into converting their mill to clean green chemistry if they're not ensured that they're going to keep their employees you know, employed, right? So true. Very interesting. We, I, I have follow-up questions on that, but I wanted to share a question from the chat from Maria, textile design major, who um, shared, I met the founder of World Pulse when she started World Pulse. It's a community of women that network. It is for women and by women. I dream of seeing something like World Pulse for textiles. Do you work with similar communities to get the word out and broaden the conversation to raise awareness and build your business? Like what is the community that you now kind of in a tangible way see around California Cloth Foundry? Or be, are you being formed around your company or like what's uh, what's the process for that? Let's focus on women for a second. Okay. She's this, right? Okay, she's badass. Just like total badass. So Gaia Herbs, the woman who runs the program that contacted us, she's in special projects and uh, Regina. So she contacted us and said, would you be interested in doing this project with us, right? Um, the woman who runs their farm, the whole farm, this is a 35 year old company that is, um, that is distributed at Whole Foods and, and globally. Uh, the, the person who runs her farm, the farm is a woman. The person who runs their marketing and advertising um, that I'm working on, uh, Regina's boss, as well as, as our copywriter, women. The, um, let's go down the supply chain. The, just on that hoodie, just on that hoodie, the um, two people that, uh, the, the sister team, that actually sew and press and finish that hoodie are women. Rona McKenzie, the head of the department, helped me to dye that garment, 50 of them, and print them over the holidays at my house where my mom was. We got three women there. I have two women daughters who are going to be um, benefiting if I succeed. The um, directories of the French Permaculture Institute in textiles is a woman. The grower of my, where is it? Um, the grower of this double-faced um, climate beneficial hoodie, the, the wool, Lani of Lani's Lana is, is a woman. She's, she's grown the wool on this. The grower of the cotton here, it, um, it's a husband and wife dynamic duo from the Central Valley. It's her farm. The founder of the Fiber Shed, the nonprofit that is all about natural dyes, natural fiber, soil to soil, is a woman, Rebecca Burgess. So I think that there's, I can go on, but you get the idea. Alice Waters. Farm to table. She was the one who contacted me in this. Why is she running the fundraising gala for the Global Climate Action Summit? Um, yeah, it's 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 happening, and I would say it's disproportionately women in the progressive side of the impact in naturals, and I would say it's disproportionately men in the mills and the historic side of the fiber growing in America and the milling of textiles in America. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. This gen these gender dynamics are fascinating. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Splendid. Yeah, so, so inspiring. Yes, a question from yes. the audience. No. Just come over. Are you a textile major? Yes. Mm -hmm. Your first year in school? No, I'm a junior. You're a junior. Wonderful. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I just wanted to ask, what's your vision for your company in the future? Would you stay in a, like project collaborations or? Um, like the manufacturing or would you extend like internationally or what do you see? 
Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's, uh, that's always, you know, I could go on and on about that. I think we touched on that already, that it is about scale. I, I don't, um, I don't want to stay small. Um, I think that you can make a greater impact at scale, obviously. We all know that. As far as growing the company and collaborating with others, they're, they're equally as important. Um, collaboration extends your reach and your impact into other brands as well as other communities and consumer bases. Um, hoping that Gaia Herbs, um, with our next project, we expand our consumer base even farther into theirs and theirs into ours. So collaboration is, is key. And um, growing the brand, yes. Um, I'd like to be a global brand. Um, I have cousins in the apparel industry in Denmark, so I have European distribution when we're ready. And um, the European Union and the UK are our far more um, progressive than we are in America, um, but we have something to offer them, obviously. And um, I think it's just convincing other brands as well as um, investors and consumers to join the party and let's grow this together, you know. Um, as I said before, it's about creating a healthy wardrobe in collaboration with nature. So. My goal is to convert everybody's wardrobe to natural, whether it's our brand in your closet or other brands that we collaborate with or other brands that are doing the same and are scaling at the same time as we are. You know, it's, it's about getting this scaled and fast. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the design side of your of your product line, thank you. Uh, um, when it comes to design, do you uh, do you prefer um, collaborating on the design side as well, or design everything in house and um, stick to ready to wear garments? So, do you envision you know revolutionizing the red carpet? as well and uh, perhaps kind of venturing in the in that direction too so um if, what are your thoughts on in general on your design process right now and where you want this to be in 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 a few yeah. years in the future yeah well if sky's the limit right um thank you alina so design i mean that's where i came from i i originated in in apparel design at fit and then um always in um, ready to wear, you know, as, as Parallels America with Tom Ford and, and Calvin Klein um, and Jones, New York, it was always, you know, separates, ready to wear, street, casual, day, um, love red carpet, definitely. I mean, I design all the time in my, in my mind and sometimes a piece or two just for fun that would be red carpet. Um, but the reason I, I should and the reason that we chose these garments um, were um, a number of them. The first was because um, the textiles that we could make the most easily were based on the hoodie, mm -hmm. right? So this textile was the beginning of our collection and how we could we could iterate on that to create like a women's textile and a men's textile that would be similar to that. So it's limited right now to minimums. Um, we wanted clothing that we could do some trade, some social media trade with. And so we didn't do a lot in lingerie, but the goal of, of you know, covering your body and the closest thing to your skin because your skin absorbs what's put on it the closest thing to your skin is your, you know, your lingerie, your under, your base layer, right? And so, where is it? It's kind of cute. I'm trying to see it. You know, we did little, we did little hammies um, and, 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 um, we call it the healthy hipster, you know. We did little base layer pieces, but when you're, when you're, you know, you have limited resources and, and finances to get, to get the brand out there and photographs, what better thing than a tank, a hoodie, a short, uh, a t-shirt, a cardigan, you know, something that's, 
it's easy to to throw on in multiple photos right out out in the public um so those are a number of reasons why you know first was my experience was always in you know ready to wear and in a weekend wear um the second is limitations of resources and materials um, and the third is, you know, marketing. How do you get free marketing? Not a lot of underwear being worn out there for trade is, you know, I mean, it'd be great, but it's better, I think, and we believe to, to make clothing that's worn as staples, right? Your jeans, your t-shirt, your hoodie, your sweats. Are always on. So that's... Your, right. pajamas, your pajamas as well. Your pajamas as well. Exactly, exactly. Spend a lot of time on those. Sleep in all of our stuff. You can sleep in our shorts and our sweatpants, our joggers, you know, our, our tank top is light and airy and very comfortable. Yeah. So our tank, yeah. um, right. So it's really about, you know, classic pieces. Yes, moving into um, expanding. Like we're doing a, a canvas pant. We're doing a high-waisted twill pant that's really beautiful, wide leg. We're doing a little what we call a barn jacket type of a uh, over piece, you know, that'll go over the hoodie for layering. So we're building out the collection, I think, as traditional designers do. Um, and I would love for, you know, put this out there. If there's a celebrity that would like us to create a, a, a red carpet dress for them, um, please get a hold of us. We would love to give some ideas. We can, we reach out to designers all the time. We collaborate with other designers um, for styling as well. But it was, it, it's indeed, the key message here is those are pieces that people wear for a long time on their bodies because those are, that interact with our skin for a long time. Typically red carpet garments are worn for the time of the event, but it's not that you live in them, depending on the profession, obviously. Right, right. Yes. I'll make it for you live in it right so we're into everything <laughs> what's your um message to students who are currently in school what do you think is the skill set that they have to learn to enter the professional world on a healthy basis right from the start what are the lacking skills in your area what do you wish fashion students would learn in school uh, so that they, when they come to work in brands like yours or in commercializing brands uh, and lines like yours to, to relay that message competently, the lacking skills or the skills they have to develop if they're not lacking, but you think that this is where their focus should be. What is that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think creativity and curiosity is number one, you know, um, don't, don't stifle that. It's, it's really, really important. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do something, right? Because you can. You can find a way to do it. Uh, there's always a way. Um, the, in, in the health side of it, because this is the, the possibilities are endless right now, just go out and discover. If, if you get a project and that project has a specific color or a specific textile requirement um, and it looks like it's it's from conventional petrochemicals go out there on the weekends call me do some research call tap into um the nonprofits that are are doing all this work in this area and see what alternatives you can find to to use in your projects if you're at a commercial company as well if you're at a you know a, a large brand that's very well established and they're maybe not as as um, abundant, let's say, in natural fashion, um, I would say take the job and and be a not a catalyst, but be be curious and suggest and do research and, and recommend like this is this is one of your best sellers what do you think if we try this color or this chemistry or this fiber, you know, um, just look for, look for even better ways to, to do it than there are right now. And don't be afraid to ask, just keep asking people and, you know, constantly email them, call them, 
um, direct message them. Um, people in the industry are really busy, but they also were a student at one time as well. And so they do have a soft spot in their hearts for answering questions and helping students if, you, if you're persistent and, and really thoughtful about your communication and what you're intending to do with the knowledge and, and their help. So just go out and get help. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Well, and another question, well, maybe there will be more questions from our uh, on-site uh, students attending. Um, in terms of the professional world, it made me think about the uh, fabric trade shows, fashion trade shows all together, out of all possible partners out there in states and in Europe, which um, like a bigger entity you feel is the most receptive or kind of vehiculating those messages in a more productive way, whether it's Premier Vision in France for textile, for textile supply. What is your best amplifying partner on the B2B side? On the B2B side, that's really hard. I would say Prima Vision. I mean, there's, there's, there was another, there's a number of them. I would, I would have to, uh, you know, I would have to maybe give you a list afterwards. Um, there's a bio fabrication. Um, there was this, a, a gathering, like a conference in, um, in France, in Paris, in January. There was a eco-fabrics conference in the UK last September. Um, there's regenerative agriculture and textiles that was a gathering I didn't get to go to, but that one was in DC last fall. There's a, a textile exchange. You know, there, there's a number of them, but the textile exchange is nonprofit. There's a number of conferences out there right now. Just look for keywords biofabrication is a, is a great keyword, you know, um, biomaterials. Um, but B2B, you're saying platforms for sales and marketing? Like uh, a trade show? Yes, like a trade show, but not direct to consumer, uh, more fostering collaborations between brands. Well, like Premier Vision is. Um, yes. Our suppliers, yeah, designers, basically. My 20s, I've been going to Premier Vision. It's fantastic. Um, I haven't gone this last couple of years, but that's a that's a great one. They always have, you know, panel discussions, so that's a great one. Yeah. Um. Yeah, um, Magic. I know that they do. They they are doing a lot with eco and green. So check out Magic and um, Outdoor Retailer. It's a show, and they do have a textile um, section. So. There, it's all it's all moving very fast right now. So B two B trade shows that's a, that's a hard one, you know, the ones I've mentioned. Yes, 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 yes. We all hope for more more wisdom in this uh, in this field and more receptivity on <laughs> on everyone's involved and the uh, uh, the. Uh, the desire for for change and and progress and innovations that you're that you're spreading, which is very inspiring. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, from our on-site mm -hmm. students, we have more questions. Yes, we do. And then after we will wrap up the conversation and we'll finish the online webinar. We'll stay online a few more minutes um, with our Zoom attendees, and everyone will be welcome to come on camera to wrap this up afterwards, but we still have a few more questions. You want to come over mm -hmm. and, and ask it? You're yeah. welcome to. And our Zoom attendees as well, please share your questions for Lydia, otherwise we will be wrapping up in a, in a few minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's me again. That's great, what's um, your name? Claudia Eileen. Claudia Eileen. Yeah. Wonderful, Claudia. Um, I want just to ask you, as a student right now here at the Academy, how can I start like screen printing with natural dyes? Is it possible? Or because the garments that you showed us are mostly like dyed completely, right? This one's screen printed. We're here with elderberries. Yeah. Elderberries. Yeah. It's fantastic. Okay. And extender base from, from soy. So you can, there's, there's extender bases, you can either make them, and they're 
online, you know, printing base, natural printing base, you can make it from starch, all different starches. I've made it from starches and reduced um, the starch down to, you know, a, a consistency that would go through the screen. Um, it's, you know, get, get some, uh, uh, I'm forgetting, it's a Japanese name. That's the one that I, it's, it's kind of expensive, but not for your use. You just get, you know, a gallon of, of extender base made from uh, soy and you, soy base, and you play around with, it, with extracts or um, botanical extracts, you can go to botanicalcolors.com. That's a, that's a very good friend of mine, Kathy Hattori. She has extracts that are in powder form. So you can actually create your own colors with those extracts or go and experiment, forage for um, natural dye plants that, that are abundant in Northern California. And you can just reduce that down, you cook it down to a liquor, you know, a, 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 like a syrup or, you know, as, as thick and reduced as possible and you add it to your extender base. Mm -hmm. You cook your colors. What? You I'm cook sorry. your colors, you cook your colors yourself, right? And then, <laughs> and then you cook it. Lot. You know, it's super fun to do if you're only doing a few pieces, but yeah, I would, I, cooking, that's, that's the traditional natural dye um, way or practice. Botanical Colors has a lot of recipes on that. So go check that out. And essentially, that's exactly what happens when they make, make extracts in the, um, the um, commercial you know, scale. They either cook it down and then freeze dry it, or they, you know, there, there's all different ways to actually extract the color out of the botanical. And, and it definitely has to do, I don't know if they use cooking as the, the technical phrase, but it's similar to cooking and dehydration, you know, into a powder. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting that because of the space we're in used to be culinary academy before becoming a fashion school here at 625 Polk. And we have those kind of all the remnants of the of the Culinary Academy uh, um, times, like giant refrigerators. So it's interesting we kind of get her in that, in that world. We perhaps should have a class on green chemistry or on um, extracting your own colors from plants and just take that process from the from the very start. Oh, system. absolutely. You've set up there already. Yes. Yes. And, okay. you know, and you're not making 50 to 1,000 or 2,000 garments in one color. You're making a collection. So you could, you could cook it all, you know. It's all, you know, from your, you know, it's from botanicals and minerals anyway. So, you know, definitely um, it's, let's experiment with that. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank Most, you so much, Lydia. Yes, you, you'll, you already shared a message for students um, uh, uh, now that we're um, wrapping up this conversation. We could go on and on and on for hours, I'm so sure. So we, uh, we hope we'll have you again in our talks um, in the next semesters, or perhaps we'll see you at the fashion show that's coming up in a month, or our portfolio. Oh, yeah. I look forward to it, yeah. Yes, and the uh, uh, so for our Zoom attendees as well, please do not disconnect right away as we're now finishing the, the webinar part of this talk and remind everyone to join us in a week for our next talk next Wednesday, um, April 24th. That will be a lecture on Bohemianism, and everyone is welcome to come dressed in their best boho look but for today. So thank you so much, Lydia, Lydia, for joining us for this talk and sharing your journey with us that's beyond inspirational. And I'm so sure everyone who joined us on Zoom and will watch us in the recording will um, uh, get yeah, that spark of, of creativity and innovation from you and will carry it forward. So thank you so much. Thank you.